It's only entertainment. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got Alvaro Torres. He is the co-founder, CEO, and director of Chiron Life Sciences. Alvaro, thanks for being on The Talking Hedge. Oh, thank you, Josh. It's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate it. So um, you're, you're in uh, Colombia right now, is that right? I am, yes, in Bogota, the capital. Nice. Well, it looks like you've got some Seattle weather behind you. Uh, yes, it's actually you know, a little bit great today. It's been sort of crazy, sunny, rainy. But that's, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to Bogota, but Bogota is 2,600 meters above sea level. So we do get to enjoy the same weather all, all year, but it's either raining or it's going to rain. So, you know, right now it looks like it's going to rain. Yeah, well, I mean, it's good weather to, to grow coffee and cannabis in and nothing like a little one-to-one CBD to THC ratio to brighten up your day if it's not bright outside. That's my go-to here in Seattle. Uh, <laughs> but for those that aren't familiar with Chiron Life Sciences, tell, tell the audience and uh, potential investors a little bit about what you do, how you got involved. Well, thank you, Josh. Well, I founded, uh, I co-founded Chiron about four years ago. And um, and the reason why I was thinking of, we were thinking about doing that is because you know medical cannabis is now becoming a, a big trend and four years ago as well. Um, and particularly in LATAM, you know, there's always been this soft, this this issue of you know, we have low cost cultivation, we have the great climate and such. But for us it was an opportunity to say, how can we disrupt the opioid business? There's more than you know, 75 million people in LATAM that suffer from chronic pain, anxiety, depression. Uh, the cost of healthcare is rising. 80% of the cost of healthcare for opiate, for chronic pain is opiate medication, and cannabis can be a very big disruptor of that. So we created a company, Chiron, which I don't know if you know, it's in the Greek mythology, which I'm very fond of and try to study as much. It was the centaur that taught Hercules medicine. And so that's why we named the company as Patron Saint of Pharmacies. And the reason we named it is because we wanted to create a company that's focused on that B2C aspect of the business. How do we go after these patients and, and improve the quality of life that they have with using medical cannabis? And then with that strategies, how can we be a vertical integrated company that cultivates low cost, high grade, you know, pharma grade type of products, having our own clinics and our own health centers and being able to treat patients and be in that vertical integration. Um, we started in Colombia and then we're now looking to Mexico, Peru, uh, Brazil, and we started looking at how we could leverage the expertise in Europe, in Germany and the UK. But it's always been about how do we improve the quality of life of people? Uh, this is not a B2B commodity business, uh, race to the zero is more, let's add value to the patients, let's, be, let's create that brand and that loyalty. And uh, you know, we started selling uh, almost a year ago and we've been growing a lot uh, using that business model, which is, uh, I would say, quite unique, particularly in Latin America. And so very, very excited to know that everything we thought about four years ago is now in, coming to fruition. And I think these markets of Latam and Europe are really just very nascent, but they're going to be like Florida was four years ago. I'm, I'm very certain of that. And you know, we're going to be the leaders of that because of that ability of uh, focusing so much on the patient, you know, and, and that vertical integration with our clinics and the data that we're developing allows us to capture a lot of that demand and, and uh, you know, create that brand loyalty with patients. It is a very unique model by comparison. In North America, we're seeing a lot more of just the producing, you know, the grow, and then the uh, consumer product goods, uh, the processing, as we call it, and then the retail, just selling it to the consumer. So it's some people have that vertical integration, that advantage you mentioned that I kind of want to talk to you about. But first, I kind of want to dive into the 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 health centers, because that's very unique. Why is that so unique to LATAM and Chi Chiron and what you're doing? How did that whole thing kind of develop? Well, um, I tell you, Josh, when we started the business, I wasn't really thinking about it when we started. I was thinking B2C for sure, uh, let's create a brand. Uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, when we were talking about strategy with the company, one thing you have to understand about Latin America, particularly, is that the adoption rate for, or let's call it the prevalence of marijuana use in our region from Mexico to Brazil is very low. And I know that sounds a little bit, uh, you know, wow, because I am Colombian and Colombia does produce 
the second most amount of illegal marijuana in the world, like Mexico. It's, it's been a, a very tough fight for the last 50 years. But what that means also is that, you know, we've been selling all that illegal marijuana to you guys <laughs> in the US and North America and Europe. So the prevalence here is not that big. Also, because you can imagine if you see Narcos 1, 2, 3, 4, all those, now there's like eight seasons, uh, you understand that illegal drugs have created a very bad and, and very difficult social problem for Colombians, mm. uh, Latin Americans. They, in terms of, I mean, most of the values of the, of the drug trade are, is happening here. It's not happening necessarily in the States. No? So we are, we've always been in that. And, and that has created a lot of, I would say, walls of, of people regarding the use of cannabis and accepting medical cannabis as something that's not recreational, knowing that recreation has created so many problems for us. So all that to say is that we are not in California or you know, Oregon or, or Washington State where there's a lot more acceptance to it. And what that all means, uh, not to get too long, is that when we're thinking, how do we go after doctors and patients and do this farm approach? So, well, that means we're going to have to hold a lot of hands with patients. It's going to take us some time to convince doctors and patients. And it's not going to be that easy or that fast to do a traditional farm approach of educating doctors and see if they prescribe. So instead of trying to go after that demand, why don't we attempt to own it? And that's when I, you know, we decided to acquire clinics, uh, health centers in Colombia, in Bogota, with more than 100,000 patient services that were focused on chronic pain and sleep disorders. So we knew, okay, the patients are here. And if we train our own doctors, we show them the evidence, and we create that ecosystem of, let's call it empirical evidence at, to begin with, that's how we start going to bring uh, a lot more adoption from the doctors and a lot more adoption from the patients. And uh, because of that, you know, that's how we started getting, we acquired these, these, these clinics, we built a new uh, clinic in Bogota with a different brand, so that, because we work with, uh, our clinics work with insurance companies, and uh, we were thinking, if we go out and say, our clinic's name is called Islands, I-L-A-N-S. If we go and say that Islands has medical cannabis, we may also face the shock of insurance companies that don't know that this is legal or that may be afraid of doing business with cannabis. So we created a new brand called Serenia, you know, which is sort of like Serene as an integrated care management with medical cannabis. And that's how we started opening our medical cannabis clinics and start bringing patients in. And so at the beginning it was very slow, Josh, even after we bought it because they, we started selling in March 19 last year, the day before the pandemic started and we got all shut down for five months. Um, and they, I remember in April we had 80 patients and you're thinking, oh Jesus, we've been building this for three years, 80 patients. Of course, now that is 4,000 patients a month. But what we started to see is that the more the doctors were able to experience the evidence from their patients, when the patients were calling, hey, I'm feeling great, or I'm not feeling great, or this is happening, the more the adoption started to grow within the clinics. And then at the same time, we started looking at what happens outside our clinics, you know, in the pharma approach that I was telling you. And we start seeing the difficulty, particularly in the pandemic, of trying to convince doctors to adopt this medication when they've been trained for 30 years on traditional pharma particularly when you don't have the ability to go to the doctor's office to train them with a, in the traditional pharma way. And, you know, we, did, we decided, of course, I think we're doing something really great. We're building a lot of evidence. Let's just go for it more because clearly the way to grow is by being able to capture that patient, educate that patient. And also in the pandemic, you know, one of the big problems of the shutdowns has been access, the patient's access. So you start looking at the data, you say, well, most of our patients are 65 years old. They cannot leave their house because of the pandemic. So let's figure out a way to do a better service, home delivery, let's build our own pharmacy, let's dispense from here. And that's just starting to evolve in a strategy now that it's clearly without the clinics, it's gonna be very hard for anybody, at least we think so, to build that demand. Two years from now, as we keep doing that, and medical cannabis becomes more mainstream, then that farm approach will take off. But that's how we start looking at it. And we just continue to uh, bet on this. We open more clinics, small satellites 
in different cities of Colombia. Uh, we started, we just opened our clinic in Peru. And because also what we realized, uh, Josh, is that in Colombia and in Latam and in Europe, you know, medical cannabis companies cannot advertise cannabis. Chiron cannot go on news or in the Facebook and say, here's cannabis for your life, like, like if it was Advil. But the clinic, the clinic can advertise that we're doing integrative care management with cannabis. And when you can do that as a clinic, you're not selling a product. You are selling a service and an outcome. And that just started to snowball in the way it's, it's happening right now. Um, and we, I think we, we thought that, but I didn't really believe then that it was going to be such a major channel until you start doing it. So that's the long answer uh, to a very smart question. But sorry, I took a, a little longer than I should have. No, that's fine. You, you just gave me a half a dozen things I want to follow up with you on. Um, so before I get to, you know, doctors and how you were able to switch them from, from uh, you know, writing a script, I want to talk about telemedicine, all of these things that, that uh, you kind of just brought up. But first, let's let's kind of take a step back and go to, uh, so we started off at the, the health centers. Let's go all the way back to your vertical integrated uh, strategy there. Are you actually growing the plant and producing uh, pl uh, plants like flower and byproducts like oil and extracts? What are you guys doing as a producer processor? So Josh, when I started the company, first thing we got is the license for cultivate. So we, we cultivate medical cannabis in four hours south of Bogota. We extracted a pharma grade extraction. The only thing that we don't do is the bottling of the extract into the 30 milliliter bottle for oils. We sell mostly oils right now. And that's just because that there, it's better to do that with somebody that's got the, the capacity to have a bottling facility and such but the product is our own. And so that vertical integration, as I was saying, allows us to do a couple of things. We grow at very low cost, of course, but I didn't want to sell that low cost, you know, like we sell coffee in Colombia, $1 a pound, you know? and then you have Starbucks mm -hmm. selling you this cup of coffee for $5 a cup. Right. You know? <laughs> and sometimes you just put milk on it, so there's, there's really not even coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, but because we are starting something so new, when we go to the doctors and train them, we have to stand by the quality of the products that they're going to be prescribing. So that is why we started growing. We build our facility of extraction. Um, and you know, all we sell at the clinic is Chiron products. And that's happening also because we are one of the few companies that has all the ability to, to produce the products according to the Colombian standards, which are very high grade. We were the first company in Colombia allowed to produce uh, bottles for commercial use. So that vertical integration allows us to think about the demand and also think about the supply. And if you look at, I'll share you the photos of the facility there in our deck. If you look at our facility, even then we said, we're not going to overbuild. We only have right now a hundred thousand square feet of cultivation in one big greenhouse. Uh, we build a very good lab that has a lot of capacity to produce. But for me, it was more, let's, be, let's, let's build this very quick, very good, and then let's focus on the demand. And as the demand keeps growing, we'll just keep expanding the supply. You know, one of the biggest problems of cannabis, particularly in Canada, is <laughs> the amount of our supply everybody built. Um, and now what's happening in Colombia, uh, we sell right now five oils, Josh. We sell a one-to-one, -one, 27, 25 milligrams per milliliter of THC and CBD a one-to-one, -one, 14 to 12, a 14 CBD, 12, milli, 12 THC milligrams per milliliter, a high THC, which is 20 milligrams per milliliter, a high CBD, 30 milligrams per milliliter, and a very rich CBD, which is 50 milligrams per milliliter, mostly focused on uh, epileptic patients. For that product particularly, uh, we decided then, you know, there's a thousand people cultivating cannabis in Colombia, Josh, a thousand licenses. When I started, it was only five. Um, and what's happening now is because not many companies worry so much about the demand. They just focus so much on, you know, we have, we're low cost advantage. Let's just build as much as we can. Now we're buying half of the flour we use for our epileptic product. We buy from a third party in Colombia at five cents a gram. Also, uh, I think when we decided to build a company, we said, well, we don't want to be in the business of, selling coffee for one dollar pound i think that's happening right now in colombia it's going to happen even worse as 
Mexico and Brazil start allowing for cultivation because people got really overexcited about the supply. And as you know better than me, in terms of international cannabis, the US is the big market, right? And even there, there's oversupply. Uh, and then you have Canada, but there's oversupply there too. And then you have Germany, EU GMP standards. Besides that, every market is just getting to grow. And every market is also looking for their own investments and their own job creation. So I think this theory that Colombian had before of let's just be the lowest cost producer, well, it's happening. And now you're gonna be buying flour at one cent a gram next year. I don't know who's making money of that, but that's just to tell you the point that we didn't need to overbuild because now some of our, even our supply for CBD, we're buying from Colombian companies. So, but that ability to have that low cost and then be able to sell it at retail at the pharmacy in our clinic, that's what gives us today that 90% gross profit. And if you think about the economics of our product, let me see if I can show you something. Well, but we sell these uh, oils. I don't have the bottle with me, somebody took it. Uh, we sell this for, let's call it 60 Canadian, uh, a, a, a bottle, and that cost us five Canadian to produce with the bottle and the syringe and the, and the, and the oil. So there's a very big margin uh, because there's low cost, because there's quality and because we, are, we know who the end patient is. So that, that's how the vertical integration works. And when we think about Peru and Mexico and Brazil, Josh, we're already selling Peru, we produce in Colombia, we send the, let's call it raw extract to Peru. We have a bottling company there, and now we just build our clinic as well. And that's the same approach we'll take into Mexico, uh, I'm hoping October of this year. And we already have our first products coming to Brazil. It's a matter of days. And in Brazil, we're gonna do the same, partner with clinics, find clinics, so that we can build the demand. And I think people underestimate how, how important it is to build that demand because there's a lot of unknowns about medical cannabis and we're not in a region that, you know, you know loves to smoke marijuana or loves to you know, th try those products. So that's, that's why we, we do that vertical integration. That's why I'm more convinced now than ever that for at least the next two years, it's the path to really sustainable growth. Otherwise, you're gonna be selling cannabis at a very low price. Every day, your price is gonna go lower. You're gonna have to overbuild tw twice to keep supplying that at a lower cost. I, I, maybe that's for some companies, certainly not something we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds like some of those uh, thousand licensees are going to be consolidated pretty soon and may end up being part of your expansion plan if or when you need that canopy space. But um, mm -hmm. moving on to the, the products that you're offering, Arizona is a very conservative uh, state. You don't see as many people buying pre-rolls as you do in Washington state, which is a huge demand here. A lot of pre-rolls in Washington. Um, but I'm imagining that Latin America, you know, Mexico and Colombia being, um, you know, I don't want to say like narco capital, but there's a lot of illegal supply that comes from those two yeah. countries. And so the perception there is much stronger against uh, the recreational side. And so I'm assuming that the products you're producing are going to be more oils and less flowers. People aren't going to be loading bongs or even smoking joints. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, what, is, what is the product? Uh, in fact, in Colombia, the medical cannabis is only for extracts. There's no dry flower sale for patients. Um, and it's only focused on extracts. The same thing happens in Mexico. I think that was a very smart decision uh, because what the Colombian governments and most of the countries that I'm wanted to do, uh, even back then, and we've changed governments twice, is to separate those two worlds, right? It's, if you want to sell medical cannabis, it's gotta be pharma grade, it's gotta be an extract. Uh, because you know, in a country like Colombia or Mexico that's flooded with you know, illegal cannabis, it would be easy for the legal markets to jump into the legal ones, uh, you know, we, without really becoming <laughs> legal type of entity. So I think that was a very good decision. And uh, you know, even in my case, when I was raising money, when I started this company, a lot of people would ask us you know, if we were not afraid about that illegal side. I tell you, it's been four years, I've never even had a brush or a, a wind of anything like that, because it's clearly two different things. It's like 
heroin and opiates. <laughs> it's, it's two different worlds, even though opiates are actually really bad for you. But you I think you that walk down the street and smell anybody's like like smoking cannabis because in seattle you can kind of smell that everywhere if you go to las vegas it's everywhere no maybe at one o'clock after a couple of nights in the the club but now marijuana it's not something that you see people smoking in the streets even though you know in colombia for the last 20 years be legal to grow cannabis at your home Uh, you can actually grow 20 up to 20 plants or 19 plants in your your house which is a lot of weed Uh, but it's just the culture it's not, it's not there. Um, I'm thinking there was more than 7% of the people, uh, less than 7% of the people have tried it. It's not something you see on the streets. It's not something that it's mainstream. And it's not like, yeah, like Seattle and, and, and San Francisco. And we just don't have that culture. And I think that when you start to try to bring medical cannabis to this, I remember even today, the, the big advertisement for marijuana in Spanish says, La mata que mata, it rhymes. It means the plant that kills. Mm. That's been the ad on cannabis marijuana for the last 20 years. And everybody in Bogota and Colombia will tell you, oh yeah, marijuana, la mata que mata, the plant that kills. So when you're trying to come up with medical cannabis and you want to break through 50 years of that negativity, uh, that's why it was so important for us to have the clinic because it's a doctor who's trained, who believes in this, it's an integrative care, and you reduce the fear of the patient and, and the patient, and, and most in most cases, the families as well, uh, who of course they're seeing their mother in pain, but they are afraid of her taking la mata que mata. So I think that challenge, which is not something you experience in the US, has made this a lot more difficult, of course particularly in the pandemic, but it also built for us a very unique positioning because you know you are the only ones doing that and you're building a brand around the safety and the, I would say, the, the seriousness by which we take medical camps. We don't joke about that at all, right? So that, that, that changes a lot. Can you just give a, a brief overview of how you're able to talk to these doctors and not to get them to write a script? When I went to one of Seattle's top doctors for gastrointestinal issues, I had, I didn't realize I was about to have an appendicitis. So my appendix had to be cut out, <laughs> taken out. Oh God, but yeah. the doctor told me I had stress induced irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. Okay. And so he was ready to write me a script. And I'm, I, he never asked me once, do you eat ghost peppers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? <laughs> Didn't ask me any, of, any question. He just asked me, what are your symptoms? I have a pill for that. And then yeah, without yeah. finding the root cause, I ended up having an appendicitis. So these doctors are so ingrained to write a script. They don't even care to, to unpeel one layer of an onion. How did you go about doing it? Well, we acquired the clinics about two and a half years ago. Uh, judge and uh, you can imagine uh, it's been two years of a lot of evidence uh, you know, thankfully cannabis there's more evidence every day you show them papers and you show them i sent our doctors uh, to canada to go uh, for two weeks and train at medical cannabis clinics in different ways so that they could get a sense of whether this worked or not even with all of that just you know, when we started and we had that March 19 date in which we were allowed to sell the first company ever and next day we got all in shutdowns and uh, the doctors even with all that training you, it was very hard because they wouldn't prescribe it even with all the training because there's a very the fear of what may happen if they prescribe THC or CBD and you have to be patient and the, the problem with that is that you know a, a patient with cannabis uh, so let's say a doctor trains, uh, gives you 0.1 milliliters of cannabis for your pain. That doesn't do anything, to be honest, right? We, we know that. Uh, and the patient takes time until they start feeling well. And uh, you know, the first two months, we wouldn't get that much traction because the doctor wasn't able to get from the patient the outcome. But after the month, the fourth month, and, and this, you have to be patient. You have to let them figure it out because we cannot force doctors to prescribe it. Um, and then you start getting positive outlooks and positive outcomes. And the patient is going back for the follow-up sorry, uh, appointment says, well, you know, I'm actually feeling really good. And then that doctor starts telling the other doctors, hey, you know what? Uh, this is happening very interesting. 
what we did is we set up a, a medical board every week back then to discuss cases, even where there were none. <laughs> and even when the cases were not you know, successful, uh, the chance for doctors to talk in a very scientific way about what was happening. And then you start getting your champions. And those champions are saying, you know what? Um, I actually tried this medication for a patient, not as a third line alternative, but as the first one. And this is working very well. Now, overall, in, on top of that, I think for our doctors, we focus a lot on pain. There's no mystery that opiates are bad for, for you. <laughs> and yeah, overall, in the health system in Colombia, in LATAM, as I told you before, a, a, pain, a patient with neuropathic pain will cost the system in Colombia about $5,000 a year, Josh. 80% comes from opiate medication, which is mostly buprenorphine, morphine, tramadol, and pregabalin. And so there's always been a push from the insurance companies to say, we cannot continue to afford this because all the healthcare is paid by tobacco, sugar, and alcohol. <laughs> and you know, at the same time, the governments are trying to always try to reduce that. So there's less money for health. It's a you know, bottomless pit. So there's that also that conversation. And then you start having your champions who are saying, well, you know, this is working, this is working. And by the month of September of last year, it's only been seven months, you start having not one, but two or three champions. And then they start saying, well, if you're bringing more patients, uh, how do we make this happen? And then a lot more patients will open up and say, I want to talk about cannabis publicly. And we start to advertise Serenia with those real life stories, which you can find on Instagram. And that's the snowball effect. Now, today our doctors are saying, we want to do publications. We know it works. And at the top of that, we've, we set up a very, I would say, uh, very strict pharmacovigilance system so that the doctors knew that you're, we're not here to prescribe just for whatever. And in some cases, cannabis can work as an integ integrative care management. And that pharmacovigilance system allowed us to, uh, doctors to, to know that we were doing this responsibly. So all of those things combined, plus patience and time, <laughs> are bringing us to today. And now today, it's really more about how many more patients can we bring in that funnel? And that's why we decided to export the model into Peru, because now we know how to prescribe responsibly. And now we know, for example, in Peru, we hired the doctors. We brought them to Colombia for three weeks, Josh, and they did their internship here. And when you come to our clinic today and you see 300 patients being prescribed cannabis for all these different conditions, you, you leave this clinic with a very good sense of why it works ethically. And if you have doubts, this company has set up a medical board that allows you to talk to other doctors and say, is this the right thing to do? There's never been any pressure for me or to anybody that you have to prescribe. I think that helps a lot because I think medical cannabis works. You don't have to pressure people to do it. It's just give them the opportunity to, to figure out for themselves. So it's a long process, but thankfully we have this conversation today and not in March of last year. <laughs> that, was, that was all theory back then. Well, I think it's an interesting conversation that that's happening on the behalf of the insurance company. Cause it's, I, I mean, just the pessimism I have with, with lobbyists in the United States pushing for opioids and everything else. It's never about the children. It's never about the health um, if it was about health in the United States, we wouldn't have the FDA going into farms that have unpasteurized milk with M16s. They would yeah. be in every mall in America stopping, you know, the obesity and, and diabetes and, the, you know, heart attacks. So it's never been about health. It's been about money. So I find that the interesting aspect of insurance, are you finding that not only in Colombia, the insurance is, is seeing that opioids are too expensive? Is it also in Peru? Do you have the backing of insurance? throughout Latin America? How does that work? So listen, I think uh, there's very macroeconomical things that are happening across the time. The, the population is getting older and the, you know, the life expectancy is increasing. And that's, let's say, a problem for the health systems, right? Because uh, that means you have a lot more patients that are going to stay in the system and you're getting your revenues reduced because of this, you know, sugar and alcohol and the gambling and tobacco, those 
are continuously being taxed a lot more to reduce the, you know, the, the use of it, but that's how you fund health most everywhere in LATAM. So there's clearly, I, I, I'm not saying the insurance company necessarily care about you know, the patient, but from an economic standpoint, you have a lot more population that's getting sicker because you know the age expectancy. You have almost all, less money all the time to be able to figure that out. And now today is becoming for, and I say in Peru, in Mexico and Brazil and in Colombia, that there's gonna be another solution. Now, you know, almost 55% of the people of the prevalence in this region and mostly is chronic pain. And chronic pain is something that's not curable. It's, you have to live with that for a long time. And I think for insurance company, what we found here, because I, I told you that we got insurance coverage in Colombia, I, I forgot to tell you, we got it done in December. Uh, and so 60% of our patients are now from insurance. Um, and if you convince the insurance companies, this is good for you in your health wise, which is why the clinic is so important, George, because we have that pharmacovigilance data. We can show this for real using international standards for measurement. And then you can say, we have patients that are, are switching from pregabalin to cannabis and we're saving you $5,000 a year. And now it's all a matter of showing that evidence to the rest of the insurance companies in all these countries because they all experience the same problem. Once you get out of this mentality that I told you before of the, the issue of cannabis and the damata kimata, you know, once you break that out, it's going to be now, okay, so it's no long, it's not the devil. Check. Now, does it work health-wise? Check. That's what the clinics are for. Third, is it more cost-efficient? Check. That is going to start pushing this a lot. Now, it's going to take time. It's not going to be done by anybody but Chiron because we've been doing it in Colombia, we'll do it in Mexico, Peru, Brazil. But two years from now, I think that will happen almost in every country. And when that happens, then you're talking about a population of 75 million people, who no longer have to pay for this. So I was, I wouldn't be that that uh, you know that firm about those predictions, but we got it done in Colombia in the middle of the pandemic because we showed that evidence. And when we did that, Josh, it was only with 2,000 patients. No, now we have 10,000. So the more evidence we're building, the more that's gonna open up. And that's I think what the future of the industry is going to be like because opiates are bad for you and everybody knows it, but there's no other option. So are, did the pandemic allow you to scale without adding additional uh, health centers? Are you finding telemedicine being a good alternative that's been fast tracked? In other words, what what did the pandemic increase or or uh, has it hindered anything? How did it impact you? And do you foresee telemedicine uh, being something that that you've uh, added? Since you said you were shut down for five months during the pandemic. I, I would think the country, yes. We thankfully we had our clinics, which are essential service. Mm. And, and because we are a pharma company, we could still operate. But in terms of people living this out on the street, we were all locked down. We, we all had to work from home, except of course the, our team in the clinics. Um, when the pandemic hit, one of the biggest worries that we had is people are not going to be able to leave their homes to go to the doctor. We're gonna have a lot of cancellations, and that started to happen. So we opened telehealth within the month so that we could recuperate those patients that could not, that were canceling appointments because they couldn't leave their home, you know? Um, and that was, that's been for us a very great tool. 15% of our appointments are coming through telehealth. Um, and then what you start realizing is the following is, you have to start thinking of telehealth as a, not necessarily for me, as the tool to lead this company because if you think about our patient base, Josh, let's say on cannabis, 65% uh, of our patients are above 65 years old. And so when you have that type of population in a region that you know is not that technologically savvy, to be perfectly honest, and if your only excuse in the pandemic to leave your house is to go to the doctor, uh, then you see that most of our older patients don't want to use telehealth. Uh, the younger population does want to use it because they're thinking more anxiety, depression, and they want something quick. For the older population, it's an excuse to go to, to, to leave and not many people like to use Zoom to go to a doctor. But what we found now is that our 
second and third and fourth consultations with patients are mostly happening through telehealth. So it's not becoming a tool for us to acquire new patients necessarily today. It's now a tool to retain, retain the patients. Because when you are in the treatment and you're doing well with cannabis, in Colombian law, you have to get a prescription every time you want the product. So now it takes a, a patient five minutes to go to the doctor virtually to just get the same prescription that he had last month. And so that's what I'm finding with telehealth. Now, it changes a lot because, you know, in our countries, we've closed and opened and closed and opened with the pandemic. So yeah, I would say there's months in which telehealth goes up to 30% because we closed this, the, the third wave. And now that we're open in Colombia, it goes down again to 15. But I tell you that without it, if we hadn't done that, certainly we would have dropped very significantly in terms of the people that were coming to our clinic. Um, so I think what we need to think about telehealth is how do we improve that tool? That's not just consultations. We have to think about remote, uh, remote uh, services. We have to think about you know, how do we do remote cl sleep clinics? So I, that's just gonna allow us to capture a lot more people. So uh, that's, what, that's how we see about it. And maybe in a couple of years that will change uh, as more people get used to the, the technology. But I think if you don't have it, even as for that, uh, you're exposed too much to the ins and outs of the first, second, third, fourth. God knows how many more waves we're gonna have. So you know, I think it was a very good decision to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great opportunity to scale without uh, additional capital. Um, also, there's people that are probably scaling for you on the producer processor side. You mentioned a thousand licenses. So just by comparison, in Washington State, we have about 450 producer processors. Oh. That's a lot. Uh, in Oregon, they had 3,500. And we saw a lot of product moving into the legacy market and making its way to, to uh, you know, illegal states. Um, and so Oklahoma, 7,000 licenses, um, and it's just crazy. So it's going to be twice as bad as Oregon. So, you know, you don't see a thousand tomato farmers. You don't see a thousand, um, you know, coffee plantations in, in Colombia, but there's a thousand licensees. And so when you're already producing at five cents a gram uh, with the terroir you have, the low labor costs and a 90% gross profit, where's the revenue opportunities for producer processors or is this just an opportunity to consolidate and start acquiring? Well, Josh, I, I'm going to speculate because I'm, I'm not, uh, not trying to, uh, to get into those, uh, you know, it's called our neighbors. No, I'm just asking for your yet. crystal ball predictions. Uh, but I think that uh, a lot of people are putting a lot of faith in the U.S., and the regulation and the fairly legal and maybe people are trying to sell CBD into the US and, and in Germany. Uh, I, I see that those are the only really two markets that would require a significant amount of growth. But um, I think those prices for the, for the few people that have the ability and the cash to be able to export those products, I don't think it's gonna be a long-term revenue opportunity because as you said, in, I didn't know the data you showed me, but I have very hard doubts that Oklahoma State one day will allow cheaper cannabis from Colombia and destroy jobs in Oklahoma. Maybe it's easy to put in, send in a couple of tons. I don't see a hundred tons because you know, cannabis is, is, uh, is generating jobs, it's generating taxes. Um, so. I think it's gonna happen like in Canada. I don't know if you know this, but Canada to date has not imported one single gram of commercial uh, cannabis from Colombia, even though there's no word that it says that they shouldn't. And this is why, this is because somebody's thinking over there, or a couple of people is, we're gonna put this application here at the bottom because we don't wanna destroy the jobs we created. And whether we like it or not, I think we are, in a, in a wall stage of you know, protectionism, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for the last six years, and it makes sense. And so I don't think it's gonna be that opportunity for more than two or three companies who really have the scale and the capacity to have the real sales strategy in Germany and in the US, uh, because 
they also have to understand and they're also understanding that the markets, even Germany is great, is big, but it's not that big to need a hundred tons of your cannabis. And if you're selling a hundred tons at five or let's say 10 cents a gram, then you're making, let's say $10 million on a facility that's gonna generate 10% gross profit. So, you know, it's, it's not gonna be for everybody. So I think there's gonna be a few companies that can do that, you know, they scale. I think you know, most of the ones that are already public that may be able to do that. I'm not sure how long that will last, Josh, because I, 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 I just don't see those markets growing that much. And you know, cannabis rots. <laughs> so if you have a hundred tons and the market in UK is just demanding one ton, what's gonna happen later? Now, a lot of the other companies are thinking at the rest of Latin America. And uh, let's tell, let's talk about Peru, for instance. No, uh, there's a new president in Peru, and I think he's going to be certainly looking at how to create an industry better inside Peru. So you may have shortened gains and certain wins, but eventually you're going to get a president or a government is going to say you are not going to be selling if you are not producing it here. Now for Chiron, that doesn't matter, Josh, because I only have a hundred thousand square feet, and. When I think about our partners in Brazil, I say, two years from now, we'll, we'll send you the strains, you will cultivate them for us, you will extract them, and you will sell them, we will sell them in our brand. We don't need to export cannabis because we're exporting know-how. Uh, so I, 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 I just don't, don't see those big, big things and, and the big market would be the US. And I still believe that even with legalization, uh, most states, which is going to still be state mandated, right? Fairly legal, but the states still rule what they want to do. I, I don't know what governor is going to allow the destruction of jobs at home. Um, and that's, that's what I would think if I were the governor of Oklahoma, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Or maybe, maybe they will allow the export of hundred tons of cannabis from Colombia and destroy, you know, 950 licenses in Oklahoma. But I just, I just don't think the protectionism thinking that we have worldwide right now is going to allow for that really massive export, even if it's flour. And if eventually Colombia allows to export flour, that then will become not five cents a gram, but 0.5 cents a gram. And then I think it's going to be a little bit more difficult to make any money. So that, that's, that's my crystal ball. I'm not too optimistic about that, but that's, if you met me four years ago, I would have told you the same things. If there's, if somebody's going to do it, it's going to be three or four companies. And they need to have the capital to have the sales force. But I think it's always going to be a diminishing returns business because anybody can grow CBD. Mm -hmm. no? So, you know, I'm not saying a commodity like that. You no, know, in Colombia, we do that a lot, Josh. We, we grow coffee, we grow bananas, we grow roses, we grow, we grow everything. Uh, but we have to move from, from that and start generating more value added because selling commodities, anybody can do that. We were the kings of coffee, Josh, until Brazil and Vietnam started growing coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the price went from $3 a pound to $1.20. And today we're happy if it goes to $1.30. So, you know, I just don't think that commodity race is going to go uh, too much. And to be honest, I'm not sure if the market requires all that amount of supply. Yeah, I think we're seeing that with a lot of the closures up in Canada with the huge canopy growth that they've got uh, shutting down. But with the North American Free Trade Agreement, there could be opportunities if you're in Canada or Mexico to get your product in, which would destroy the Canadian market that's still somehow getting $6 a gram wholesale. We're in the U.S., you know, in certain states, you're, you're they're producing at $1.30 wholesale. So, um, that would disrupt the market. I can't even imagine what five cents would do to, I mean, all of these companies would, would be out of it. So having said all of that, how would you give advice to somebody who wants to still come into Latin America knowing all of that? What advice do you have for somebody that wants to come in and set up shop? Well, um, I, I think the, the market is, if so, if you're looking for investment in Latin America for medical cannabis, uh, starting from scratch, I'm not sure it's something the market would appreciate right now for investors because there's a lot of companies that have already done it before and have learned to all the things. So if you ask me and somebody says, well, I want to open a, get a license in Colombia, I will tell you, well, that's worth $1. You can buy that right now. But that's going to still take you two years to get it done. 
Um, I think the interesting things that are going to happen here are going to be on the, on the finished product and uh, looking for laboratories that can produce that additional value added for medical cannabis, which is really going to more take off. I think you should be setting yourself up for either clinics or a more pharma approach because eventually those products will have to go through that you know, pharma GMP type of facilities. Um, I think in, in countries like Brazil or let's say Mexico, for instance, that Mexico I think is going to be the biggest opportunity beyond medical cannabis, um, particularly when it comes to, let's say, adult use, if it happens next year. But even if without it, in the CPG world, and you said it yourself, uh, the free trade agreement, it, that's an opportunity that, for example, that Colombia doesn't have. We don't have a free trader, a NAFTA, right? So imagine what we can do competing against Mexico, who eventually will have all that market for themselves, no? because they're in NAFTA. So if you look at LATAM and you think in Mexico, you think, well, there's a big CPG opportunity here uh, because it is the fifth largest consumer market in the world for any product. And Coca-Cola is Coca-Cola because of Mexico as well. Right? Everybody drinks Coca-Cola there. So for CPG, I think it's a big opportunity in Mexico. If you think about brands, you think about retail. In the adult use, um, I think the opportunity there is more on the retail side just because there's still a very big illegal aspect to Mexico and, and you know I don't think you want to be selling weed on the streets <laughs> with that market but on the retail side there's a big opportunity you know cities like Mexico City have 24 million people those are opportunities of 100 150 200 stores type within the same city because it takes you seven hours to cross the city one is the other uh, and in medical cannabis it's going to be for me it's labs clinics farmer grade um, but if you want to get in the cultivation business, but I think you can have a sense that it's not something that I, I particularly think it's that interesting. Um, you know, I don't think that's the right way to approach it. And if we know something from the US is that the most successful companies in the US, MSOs, are those who have built a stronger retail presence so that they can understand what the consumers want, go back and develop those products and, and have those relationships more so than just growing of the cannabis. I think growing the cannabis is going to be the easiest part. It's going to be a lot of people can do that. Um, but the retail, CPG, developing brands, thinking about cross uh, you know, country NAFTA agreements in the next three years, that's exciting. That's exciting. And, and then after that, Brazil, medical, pharma grade, the same things I'm telling you. It certainly for me, would, wouldn't be about grow. Now, Maybe one day Brazil will allow the growth of cannabis. And when that happens, there will be a lot of demand. And if you want to get in the commodity industrial side of hemp, for instance, that's, Brazil is a really good play. You know, but that would be probably for me three, four years from now. I think the opportunities of medical and selling high value products anywhere, uh, Mexico, CPG, and uh, you know, the opportunities that NAFTA will offer. Well, we covered a lot. Is there any links that you want to leave in the um, description or show notes that I'll put in there for anybody to contact you, investors or otherwise, who are interested in uh, what Chiron Life Sciences is doing? Well, Josh, I, I, I just say, you know, first of all, thank you so much for, for your time. I, we've been building a business slowly and slowly in a market, very difficult conditions with COVID pandemic and, and in a very nascent market. I think that, as I say to my team, if we've been able to grow at this rate with all these things happening, imagine what we can do without it, now that we're coming out soon. I think certainly Latin America, when I think about it, is Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Brazil, UK, and Germany. These are markets that are like Florida four years ago. And if you have the right go-to-market strategy, it's just gonna be a matter of time before, you know, when you're building that demand, um, we're building a very niche um, positioning within our within these countries. And so, you know, it's not as attractive. Everybody's thinking about the MSOs and the Canadian, and but I like to think that we we thank, thankfully because the U.S. and Canada we have that crystal ball of what's happening in the industry today, those developed markets. So we're able to go back and say, well, let's not do that. <laughs> we don't let's not build uh, 100 hectares because it's not going to work. Uh, but I think patience, uh, demand, signs, that's going to work out. Insurance coverage, you will see that. There's no even insurance company in Canada, covers in Canada, and that's going to be a very exciting market in the next three years. And for me, for me, I, I'm very happy that we're able to lead that conversation and very excited to be on that opening that jungle 
Uh, but I think in that case, first mover advantage is going to play a very big role in that, you know, leadership in the market. Yeah, I would agree with that. We're going to uh, leave a link to your website. And if anyone wants to contact you through LinkedIn, we'll have that in the uh, description in the show notes as well. Yes, so that- yes. Just, uh, maybe I'll send you uh, Paola Ricardo is our IR manager. Uh, her email is uh, pricardo at chiron.ca. Um, an investor inquiry also through her. Uh, she's now in Toronto, but she does a really good job on on getting back and feedback to investors and potential shareholders or people who want to do business with us. We're looking for clinics, we're looking for growth. Yeah, we'll put her information in there as well. All right, with that, I think we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, uh, Alvaro Torres. He is the co-founder, CEO, and director of Chiron Life Sciences. Alvaro, thanks for being on the Talking Hedge. Josh, pleasure. Thank you for that. It was a great conversation and looking forward to being back. Yeah, I would look forward to that as well. I am Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.